Hi. Today I'm here to explain that Jerry, Jerry these are load-bearing load walls. They're not gonna come down. But they don't necessarily have to be. Topology optimization in generative design has a fairly interesting origin in mathematics, but of course I designed and printed some things. I'm here to explain why nowadays things are starting to look a lot like this, or like this, and why everything in cars and engineering is starting to look like Jeff Goldblum is trying to download a virus into it. Now this is really a history lesson with some real world tests, mostly focusing on static loads in a given material. If we went through all forms of failure and really anything but von Mises, that's not a YouTube video, that's an engineering degree, and it would take a little bit longer. But realistically, von Mises can get you through 90% of things hanging off of other things. Let's start with a simple lever. FA is over here, FB is over here. We have a fixed point, and we know the distance between FA and the point and FB and the point. Call that L1 and O2. So F sub B equals F sub A times L1, and that's all over L2. Say this 10 pound object, this one inch, and this is five inches, we can plug that in and get two pounds needed over here to lift 10 pounds over here. This works great outside of this lever not having any thickness. As soon as 10 pounds is put on it, it'll bend or snap. This also depends on the ductility of the material. Some bend fairly easily, and then some crack almost immediately. This also depends on the temperature of the material, as ABS has a very sharp drop-off for ductility in relation to temperature. We're ignoring that, because SolidWorks has a very nice drop-down menu of materials and stresses that they have, and how elastic they are, and you don't have to change a thing. Unless you're doing some weird titanium oddball alloy with jet engines that... Oh, yeah, never mind. So we replace our fixed point with a set of bearings and maybe get it a bit of height so we have a nice triangle and put some mounting points on either side so we can attach it to things. Perfect. And this will work. It's not bad. We can run a Von Mises in it, put 100 pounds of force on it. It passes with a factor of safety of about 1.5. Way higher if we work on whatever's going on here. No problem. Sometimes foreshadowing is relatively obvious. Problem is, it's also heavy and uses a ton of material. Let's also pretend that this needs to move very fast, like maybe if it was a rocker arm and an engine or something, who knows. Or it's in a race car where ounces matter. Or you're making a run of 700,000 of them and the 60% of unnecessary material is heavy, expensive, and just not needed. I needed to put my three quarters of a history degree to good use, so here's the longest answer possible. Leonhard Euler, shown here reacting to how I pronounced his name, was born in 1707. Growing up friends with the Bernoulli family, he would join Daniel Bernoulli at the Academy at St. Petersburg, established two years earlier by Peter the Great. Daniel and Euler would go on, most notably, to create revolutionary studies in fluid dynamics that are still in use today. It is in a typical flying attitude. They also came up with a way to calculate blood pressure, which I'm not going to describe here because I like monetization. In 1736, walking around the town of Kronig... Königsberg. He created a problem using the seven bridges that were in the city. Known as someone who names things creatively, he called his problem the seven bridges of Königsberg. The foundations of graph theory come from analyzing the problem. Euler understands that he doesn't actually have to walk the path to understand the outcome. And that outcome was that it was not possible to visit all four landmasses or nodes of the city crossing each bridge or edges only once. The number of bridges each landmass has is called a degree. Using this simplified relationship, he was able to derive a set of general rules about what paths were possible. This is an oddly simplistic solution. Anybody with a pen and paper can trace the lines of the picture and come to the same solution. But what about if we expand to hundreds of nodes, or thousands, or need to define the structure of molecules? In 1877, that exact connection was made by James Sylvester, who published a paper and connected how chemists were drawing diagrams since the 1860s. Topology found its roots within graph theory in the 1736 problem by Euler with one premise in mind. If you were reducing the graph to not rely on the shape of the objects, as the position of the bridge doesn't matter, the connections of it do, Defining what topology does matter is very important. From this need arises the notion of homeomorphism. Essentially, two spaces can be homeomorphic if one can be transformed into the other without slicing or reattaching. 
A classic joke is that the topologist cannot distinguish between a coffee mug from a donut, since a donut could be reshaped into a coffee cup. Furthermore, because I can't let a good spherical cow joke go untold, here's a cow turned into a ball. This is very important, because it's one half of our topic. Topology optimization is taking topology and morphing it based on loads, boundaries, and other defined parameters as needed, mostly based around manufacturing constraints, more on that later. So how does it do it? Well, two huge developments converge in a covered wood and form something fantastic. Anthony Mitchell published a paper in the London, Edinburgh, and Dublin Philosophical Magazine and Journal of Science, Fall 1904, titled The Limits of Economy of Material in Frame Structures. That's a terrible title. It is the foundation of structural optimization that wouldn't be realized until computational power took off almost 50 years later. To show how direct of an impact Mitchell structures have in modern topology optimization, I built a plate with two holes, applied force in a direction with example A. The resulting optimized shape is almost identical to Mitchell's A structure. So how does it work? Well, Maxwell's load path theorem sets it up quite well. If a tension or compression load path is longer than it needs to be, or not ideal, then the entire structure is compromised twofold, both in the tension side and in the compression side. Therefore, if we can find a situation where the tension length is optimized, the compression load path will also be optimized, and vice versa. That's branch A. Branch B is found that it is very difficult to run those calculations by hand in 1905, let alone on project-specific problems. That's where two things come in, computers and finite element analysis. See, solving some differential equations is hard. Actually, that's a huge understatement. We can't solve most of them. Some have million dollar prizes if you can solve them. Continuing with science, always choosing the most creative name, finite element analysis involves breaking differential equations into smaller chunks or a mesh. From there, an equation can be derived to optimize quality and cost to constraints. If a connection between nodes has little or no effect when removed or weakened, it's minimized. A computer can do that thousands of times per second and even run multiple cases where it tries leaving some and minimizing others. So, if we take the trial piece from a 4, put it through topology optimization, we end up with a mesh, and if we clean that up, we end up with this structure. The structure is 60% lighter, but has a significant point of failure. All of this comes together to answer the title of this video, which is Why Do Structures Look Like That? And the answer is, is that manufacturing techniques have reached a point where we can start to make them. We've combined a few tools from the past that have been around for 50 years and now have the technology to 3D print components with additive manufacturing and the computer processing power to design shapes and structures in a way that we couldn't before. All of that's to say, this really isn't out of reach for home builders and garage tinkerers. Both SolidWorks and Fusion 360 have built-in topology optimization with add-ins for generative design on SolidWorks and generative design on Fusion 360. Uh, and it adds an hour in design time to save a whole lot of filament, plus it looks really cool. So I've been using it more and more. So there we go. That's just a general overview of topology optimization and stuff like that. Uh, like I said in the last video, I am moving currently. That's why everything is a disaster in here. And hopefully I'm moving soon enough to where this won't be a disaster soon. Anyways, if you like this video, please like, subscribe, comment, and uh, thank you very much for watching.